Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Bechet, and this is the AAF Exchange, a podcast from the American Action Forum where experts provide clear, data-driven insight into today's economic and domestic policy issues. Welcome and thank you for tuning in. The trade war with China is dominating the news right now. President Trump is apparently looking for a deal with China, and he imposed tariffs on a lot of imports from both China and around the world. Here to break down the current situation is Jacqueline Varis, Director of Immigration and Trade Policy at the American Action Forum. Jackie, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So Jackie, how, how did we get into this trade war? What, what was the origin of it? The president campaigned on getting a better deal for Americans. So if you remember his announcement speech, he talked all about how Mexico's ripping us off uh, because we buy a lot of things from them. And so this was his version of trying to make America produce again by imposing tariffs on everything from steel and aluminum to just about every good we can from China. This worldview has caused him to dig up these antiquated, rarely before used laws to try to justify these new tariffs that he's been imposing. The only problem is every time we've imposed a tariff on another country, that tariff has been matched dollar for dollar with retaliation from that country onto our exports as well. Now, what is the president's goal of these tariffs? President Trump, like I said, is a big supporter of domestic industry. He looks at the streets and he sees too many BMWs, not enough Fords and Chryslers. So he wants to bring back American manufacturing, bring back in quotes, right? Because we are a services economy. We are best at producing technology, uh, information, non-tangible things. Now, what about balancing the trade deficit? I've heard a lot about that. Balancing the trade deficit is definitely one of President Trump's goals. Uh, He has this misconception that because we import more than we export, that it's like making a bad business deal. What he doesn't understand is that consumers benefit from imports. We simply have a higher demand for consumption than what is made in America. More than that, we have a higher demand for investment than what we can feasibly do just in America. So that's why international trade is also a way for us to borrow foreign dollars to help us meet that investment demand. Really, without trade, we wouldn't have access to any of this. We wouldn't have access to the things not made in America. Uh, Prices at Walmart would be much larger than they are now. Prices to make things in America would be much larger than it is now. And, we, and we're going to go into all that economic impact a little later in the show. But for a moment, let's take a step back and make sure we're all still on the same page. Can you just give us a brief outline of what tariffs actually are? Sure. A tariff is a tax on an import. So take the iPhone, for example. The iPhone, contrary to what some may think, is made in many different countries. So if we put a tariff even on the smallest iPhone part, on the screen, for instance, that is going to increase the cost of that phone, and you're going to be paying more at the Apple store. Um, The other thing that tariffs do is increase the, the... price of raw materials, like I said before. So when you put a tariff on steel, every single manufacturer that utilizes imported steel sees their costs go up. How much does support do these tariffs have? Because as an iPhone user, hearing that, I it makes me worried. You should be worried. Uh, The tariffs are not widely supportive. Uh, Definitely not supported in D.C., not supported by the farmers who are now um, really getting loud with with their pain. They're expressing to the government how much these tariffs are hurting them, especially the retaliation. Uh, There's been a lot of retaliation on U.S. agriculture because our trading partners, the ones we're hurting, they know that agriculture is so important to the United States. So there's been a lot of a change in public opinion recently. I'd say that the only folks that are supportive of the tariffs are those that view them as something temporary, as a negotiating tactic to try to get China to stop stealing intellectual property, for example. The thing with that is that the tariffs have not actually resulted in anything like that. They have not caused China to change their behavior. All they've resulted in is uh, escalating trade war. All right. Well, let's talk about China specifically and the tariffs that are you know, targeted at them. What is the current situation with China? 
the reason we put tariffs on China was to try to get them to change their behavior, to stop unfair trade practices. There's wide consensus in the international community that China has been engaging in um, the theft of intellectual property. They have this policy of forced technology transfer, where a lot of the times an American business cannot do business in China without giving over some of its trade secrets. Uh, China also has restrictions on investment. So there's restrictions on how much American businesses can even expand into China. You know, they have total control over, you know, things like Facebook and, and more Internet type of technologies. So there are real problems that do need to be dealt with. What the United States did, or I should say what President Trump did, was decided to unilaterally impose tariffs on about $50 billion worth of Chinese imports. This first round of tariffs was aimed specifically at sectors and and, and products that are in tech and, and are highly susceptible to this IP theft. However, after China retaliated to those tariffs dollar for dollar, what President Trump did was impose further tariffs on uh, about $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. To do that, he needed to expand past just the tech sector, and that hit consumer goods, it hit autos, furniture, agriculture, a lot of things that have wider impact than what was originally intended to. And now, after the latest round of um, tariff increases and retaliation, what the United States is looking at is imposing tariffs on every import from China, uh, about $540 billion worth of goods in 2018. Basically, we've backed ourselves into a corner with this tariff retaliation and escalation, tit for tat, where the only hand the president has to play is to impose more tariffs and hurt U.S. consumers and producers even more. Yeah, it does not seem like a corner we really want to be in. Can you give us some specific examples of what, you know, what goods we have uh, seen retaliatory tariffs in? Like I said, agriculture is a big one. It's widely known that the United States is one of the biggest agricultural um, sectors in the entire global economy. It's one of our biggest export sectors, especially. Uh, something that hurt my heart very much was when the EU and Canada and others retaliated against bourbon because that's a source of American pride. <laughs> um, there was also similarly retaliation against Harley Davidson. And those latter two examples were strategically um, imposed. They were political motivations, uh, retaliatory tariffs imposed by other countries to hurt Trump's base voters specifically. It was very strategic. All right. So let's start talking about some of those economic impacts. Plainly, what are the economic impacts of tariffs? Uh, every economist agrees that tariffs are bad for, for consumers <laughs> and producers. More than that, I mean, just history shows it, right? So the first thing that tariffs do, because it is a tax on consumption, it increases the cost of consumer goods. So that's the Walmart example like I was talking about. Um, my mom works at Walmart and I was just talking to her about it. You can expect those prices to go up dramatically after we impose tariffs on China. I mean, practically everything you buy from Walmart is made at least in part in China. Uh, the other thing they do is increase the cost of production. So like the steel tariffs, for instance, um, the raw materials that producers use to make things here in America. It's kind of counterintuitive because President Trump wants to strengthen and embolden uh, U.S. manufacturing, but the tariffs actually weaken it and they make it harder to make things here in America. Uh, other economic results... Uh, because businesses have less money to spend when they're spending more on their inputs, they decrease investment in other sectors. So, or not other sectors, but um, like their future plans for investment. So, for instance, uh, if they had a plan to open another factory, hire more workers, they may have to hold off on that in order to absorb some of the increased costs that they're incurring from the tariffs. Uh, it leads to product shortages in the short run because. You know, you can't just absorb a tariff increase overnight if there's no money to support that. So you either have to pass on the increase to your consumer or you just won't have access to that good anymore. And then another thing it does is uh, causes disruptions in supply chains. So 
within North America, sometimes a good will cross the U.S. Mexico border three or four times before it's completed, and with Canada as well. If the cost of of crossing the border, if the cost of trade goes up, that's going to dramatically disrupt those supply chains that we've all come to rely on. Well, I think this is an excellent time to also talk about one of your great resources on American Action Forum's website, Ion Trade, which has m- one of my favorite tool uh, trade tools, Tariff Watch. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so uh, Tariff Watch was our way to try to keep y'all informed about what's going on. I'm, I'm basically counting in dollars every tariff imposed in the corresponding retaliation and trying to give a sense of what that might do to your pocketbook and, and how much prices are going to increase nationwide. So, so far, counting the last round of tariffs on China um, and also the last round of steel and aluminum tariffs that were just revoked because after the United States negotiated the new NAFTA with Canada and Mexico, uh, something called the U.S.-Canada-Mexico trade agreement. As a part of that, just uh, recently, tariffs on steel and aluminum were revoked on Canada and Mexico. So with all of that considered, the most recent number is we have tariffs on approximately $260 billion worth of imports uh, just because of President Trump's latest latest efforts. So that amounts to about a $63 billion increase in consumer costs um, throughout the whole economy. On top of that, we have retaliation from our trading partners on about $110 billion worth of our exports. So how do we get out of this mess? So this clearly is not a good situation for anyone. It's hurting global tensions. Uh, It's making negotiations difficult because no one wants to deal with the United States when we're just going to do some crazy tariff action, uh, and even if it's against our own interest. So the best thing that we really could do is remove the tariffs that President Trump has imposed. Now, how do you do that? When it comes to China, we really do need some sort of deal to make that happen. President Trump is not going to be willing to just go back on everything he's worked so hard to, to try to fight for. So realistically, the president probably is going to demand something big from China. Um, now, in in my opinion, what I would love is just some small concession or symbolic agreement to to give us an excuse to revoke the tariffs we've already imposed, and then for us to pursue a, a different strategy, one that I think would probably have a greater chance of success, and that is pursuing a case at the World Trade Organization. So if y'all don't know, the World Trade Organization was set up to resolve disputes just like this. It's kind of the um, the place that you go when an unfair trade practice is taking place or, or you think that one of your trading partners is doing something illegal. The United States could join in, in something similar to a lawsuit with other nations and, and really pursue a case against China. And in that way, it might not be as fast as just slapping a tariff on something, but if we do it that way and the WTO does rule in our favor, then China would be punished and and forced to change its behavior. But even more, there wouldn't be a threat of retaliation against us. Are there any good examples from the past of this working? So a case that just got finished at the WTO, it's a pretty high profile one. Uh, It was basically Boeing versus Airbus. So Boeing is a U.S. kind of airplane manufacturer. Airbus is is in the EU. The WTO found that both are being subsidized, which is basically it, it means that the government is giving the private company money in order to um, be able to sell their product at a lower price and, and get a competitive edge. So WTO, that case took a long time, uh, longer than average. But now that it's resolved, both the U.S. and the EU have indicated that they're going to take steps to reverse those illegal subsidies. That, I think, is, a, is an example of how the international trading system should work. And, and I think it's a better route to follow than just imposing tariffs unilaterally and getting sued all over the place like we are now. <laughs> Yeah, I think it would be a good idea to avoid getting sued. So what about longer term solutions? 
Longer term, the United States really should be pursuing multilateral trading negotiations. What that means is just a trade agreement, right? Something like NAFTA, um, something that lowers trade barriers between us and other countries. So if you remember, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was one of these trade agreements. Uh, It seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't. Basically, it was an agreement between the United States and 11 other nations in the Asia Pacific that would have eliminated, I believe, 99% of tariffs right away and 100% of tariffs within a few years. So President Trump ripped up that trade agreement in his first week of office. And that really wasn't the best thing to do uh, because TPP, more than just benefiting U.S. consumers and producers economically, it would have put that pressure on China via exclusion. You know, trade would have diverted away from China toward these other Asian Pacific nations and the United States. And it may have had the same result of getting China to change its behavior, but just via international pressure instead of this economic tool that isn't really working. And by the way, TPP did go on without us. It is an agreement currently in force just without the United States. So we could definitely have the option of rejoining it in the future. Mm -hmm. So you outlined all these solutions. What can we expect in the next year? Uh, Two big things in the next year um, to look for. The first is some resolution to this China agreement. Like I said, we need to get some sort of deal and ideally we would get to a reversal of all of the tariffs imposed on China, and then as a result, a reversal of all the retaliation that China imposed on us. Another thing to look for, like I mentioned before, the U.S.-Canada-Mexico trade agreement. So that agreement is done being negotiated. Uh, It now has to be put up to a vote in Congress. And the reason that's important is because the president has said quite a lot that he would have no problem just withdrawing from NAFTA completely if USMCA doesn't get put through Congress. Given his past behavior, that may seem like a radical threat, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities. So I think USMCA passage is something that we should definitely be looking for. And I think it's something that the United States needs to do to preserve North American trade and and frankly, the North American economy. Well, we have come to the final part of the podcast, which is also one of my favorite parts of the podcast, where I get to ask you something fun and exciting. Uh, You mentioned bourbon and how heartbroken you were over the fact that they were retaliatory tariffs were put on top of them. How did you get so interested in bourbon? So I love bourbon, Uh, all whiskey, really, but bourbon has my heart. I I learned to drink whiskey from my dad. Uh, He, however, has a very narrow view of what he likes. He really likes crown and and blended whiskey, Canadian whiskey, actually. Um, So I kind of took it a step further. I've been trying to have a taste for all different types of whiskey. But I'd say I I really like bourbon, not only because it's made in America. I really don't care about that. Um, It just tastes really good, especially when it's finished in wine cask, in the port cask. It's delicious. It sounds like we could do an entire podcast on this alone. Um, (laughs) I would love to. Do you have a favorite brand before we? (laughs) Uh, Right now, I'd say Angel's Envy. I really like Angel's Envy. Um, I've been trying to expand out, though. Mm -hmm. I have this dream to open a whiskey bar one day, just (laughs) wall to wall, different types of whiskey, where I stock everything from bourbon to scotch. Um, But yeah, I'd say right now, I like Angel's Envy. Well, I will definitely show up for the scotch portion of that. Uh, Jackie, thanks for joining us today. (laughs) Absolutely. It was fun. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Tune back in for our next episode where our experts will provide clear, data-driven insights into today's economic and domestic policy issues. I'd also like to encourage you to check out any of the links in our show notes um, from this episode and also follow us on social media to hear more about AAF.